Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, our speaker for today is uh, Chris Risley. Uh, so a bit of uh, background for our uh, uh, the speaker today. So Chris is currently a research fellow at the Alma Mater Studiorum, the University of Bologna. He graduated from the University of Southampton in 2016, where his thesis was focused on studying galaxy clusters and superclusters. And this is actually his uh, main uh, topic of research. Uh, during his PhD, he had studied uh, diffuse, radio diffuse radio emission in a variety of merging clusters at low and high redshift and attempted to characterize their magnetic field properties. Uh, amongst uh, other uh, work, he also characterized the radio source population in a galaxy supercluster field using highly sensitive low frequency observation. After his PhD, he moved the research fellowship to CSIRO Space and Astronomy in Western Australia, where he, uh, he was working on multi-frequency polarization surveys with MWA and Australian SK Pathfinder. Pathfinder. Then uh, in 2019, he moved uh, to Bologna uh, in Italy, where he actually continues his cluster studies using radio astronomy facilities across the globe in order to untangle the mysteries of uh, the magnetic fields. A very interesting uh, story. So uh, let's welcome Chris and thank you. I'll, I'll leave the stage to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Konstantinos. And thank you everyone for turning up um, and listening to me ramble about galaxy clusters for a while. Okay. Hopefully you can now all see my screen. If I just attempt to re, uh, relocate the little mini Zoom window. Um, yes, thank you for turning up and listening to me ramble about the magnetic fields and clusters of galaxies. Um, I'm going to be telling you about the perspective that I get as a as a radio astronomer. I'm not a theorist. Um, I like to get my hands dirty with data, which has its own uh, joys and problems and difficulties that I'm sure many of you are all aware aware of. Um, lots of credit to all of the fantastic people I have worked with over the course of my career, from whom I have learned many things um, and without whom I wouldn't be where I am today. So uh, yes, thank you to everyone who has, has an influence on my career as well. So the structure of this talk, aside from seeing lots of pretty pictures like this one you're seeing here on the right, I believe you all should be able to see my mouse. So I hope so. I will try and talk my way through uh, the breakdown of my slides anyway. Aside from seeing a lot of pretty pictures, I'm gonna teach you, I'm gonna give you a bit of background. Um, a lot of the talk will be about background. So I wanna talk about the contents of a galaxy cluster, um, you know, break it down into its constituent components. I'm gonna talk about the kind of non-thermal phenomena um, that we see in galaxy clusters, uh, uh, you know, your, your radio emission. And I'm gonna talk about particle acceleration mechanisms. So I wanna tell you, you know, how the things that I study are generated. Um, and then I'm going to give you a bit of discussion about the state of the field. I'm going to tell you some of the latest and greatest results that have come out over the past few years and tell you a little bit about um, some of the observational techniques that we use to understand the magnetic fields in clusters and uh, how these various radio sources we see are studied. And then give you a little bit of a, a touch on um, what I like to call a blurred picture because, you know, the we have these classes of source and the taxonomy is getting ever more blurry the deeper we go and the more data we get. And finally, I'm gonna give a very brief outlook on where our work will take us as we move into the era of the square kilometer array. So first things first, a little bit of background. I like to put my work in context. So uh, I like to start off with a slide telling you about magnetic fields in the universe. Magnetic fields are everywhere in the universe. Um, we, we know that it's very well established from observations, but you know, how did they get there? So we know that um, things like stars and planets, um, you know, we all have magnetic fields. You know, life, life on Earth wouldn't exist without the magnetic field. We have the beautiful aurora that we see in the sky. Uh, we use magnetic fields for navigation. Um, and you know, stars have magnetic fields, and we've seen those on all kinds of scales. Moving to larger scales, you have the ordered magnetic fields um, and the kind of magnetic fields that you see here on the right in this uh, multi-wavelength image of a spiral galaxy from Fletcher and Beck uh, a few years ago. 
But on the very largest scales, uh, magnetic fields look a little bit different. And here you're seeing some numerical simulations from Julius Donat. So you're seeing uh, the evolution of magnetic fields from high redshift around redshift of four down to redshift zero. And in these simulations, you're seeing what the magnetic fields look like when they're seeded by galaxies on the left and when we have a primordial seed field on the right. So under these two scenarios, which we kind of call, we refer to as magnetogenesis, um, on the left, you know, magnetic fields were injected into the universe by the first stars and galaxies. And on the right is the kind of situation where we have primordial seed fields left over from the very early universe. And you, you start these off at high redshift and you run your simulation, you run the clock down to redshift zero, and this is kind of the situation you get. So in these kind of overly dense regions, which is the clusters and superclusters of galaxies, we see relatively similar magnetic field properties. But in these sparse uh, underpopulated regions, we see a very different kind of magnetic fields uh, structure. So by looking at magnetic fields on a variety of scales in the universe, we can work our way back to untangling the origins of cosmic magnetism itself. I like to study clusters in the cosmic web with a particular focus on clusters. And here's a, 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 a gradually staged zoom in from the Millennium simulation. So you've got your, your cosmic web, these very large scale filaments, and then you zoom in a bit and you see some more structure in the filaments. You zoom in a little bit more and you start to see the, um, you start to see superclusters of galaxies, and then you see the galaxy, the cluster itself. So on the very largest scales, you have the cosmic web, and there's been much work on mostly pretty much all essentially done on, on stacking observationally or through looking at simulations by people like Tessa Wernström, Ariel Amaral, and uh, Frank Hovatza, trying to understand the magnetic properties of the cosmic web. In these sort of filamentary regions, um, we have galaxies and diffuse gas that kind of populates the large scale structure. And this is a very pristine environment. It's hard to study because we don't really have any, we don't have much of a tracer for these regions. So we have to go really, really deep. But because there is not much stuff, there's not much stuff there, it's a very pristine environment. So it's much more sensitive to the original underlying seed mechanism. So it's hard to study, but if we can get there, then we'll be able to learn a lot about um, the magnetization of the early universe. And then clusters and superclusters, these are the bread and butter of my research. These things form at the, the nodes and intersections, the crossroads of the large scale structure, and they're very dynamic environments. So there's a lot of feedback mechanisms to consider uh, when, we, when we try and understand magnetic field properties of clusters. And that's what I work on. So let me break down a galaxy cluster for you. Here is an image from the Dark Energy Survey of a particular galaxy cluster. Uh, just looking at this, you might not recognize which one it is, but it may become obvious as the slides start to build. Um, galaxies in a cluster, you know, they number typically hundreds to thousands of galaxies. But in terms of the overall mass budget of a cluster, they only represent a few percent of the total mass. Dark matter, which um, you, know, you can't see here because um, it's dark matter, traces about 80% of the total mass budget of a cluster. And we learn more about the dark matter uh, distribution in clusters of galaxies through things like um, lensing. And we can also infer stuff about it from the SZ effect. Then if we overlay the in blue, what we see at X-ray wavelengths, uh, this is mostly the intracluster medium. This diffuse stuff you're seeing here is the ICM. This is your sparse, your under dense, your hot plasma, um, which makes up about 15% of the total mass budget of a cluster. And when you hear me referring to thermal components, nine times out of 10, what I'm referring to is the intracluster medium itself. Um, and you can also see sort of various background uh, active galactic nuclei as these bright blue point sources. And then finally, if we, if we overlay what we see in the radio wavelengths at very long wavelengths uh, in red, this is tracing our diffuse synchrotron emission. Um, so what we see here in the red are your relativistic electrons spiraling round and round in magnetic fields. These are what I refer to, what I will refer to as non-thermal components. And then here, exactly, we have, this is what we see in the galaxy cluster Abel 2744, which is a gorgeous complex merging cluster that's had a lot of work done on in the literature, most recently by my colleague, Kamlesh Raj Parohit, who uh, shared this data with me. So thank you, Kamlesh. 
We see radio galaxies, the sort of uh, moderately extended sources. Um, radio galaxies are fantastic. We can learn tons about the galaxy evolution in the complex cluster environments, uh, cluster dynamics, and the evolutionary history of a cluster by looking at radio galaxies, but that's not the topic of this talk. Here in the cluster center, we have uh, diffuse radio emission, uh, which is referred to as a radio halo. Abel 2744 hosts a known radio halo. It's very fantastic and complex. And then at the cluster periphery, we see a couple of extended arc-like radio sources, which are radio relics. And don't worry too much if you are not super familiar with the terms radio relics and radio halos and whatnot, because I'm going to break it down over the next few slides. Uh, but ABEL2744, in fact, hosts four radio relics. There are a couple that you can't really see very well on this scale, so I haven't really highlighted them, but there is a relic somewhere around here, and there is a radio relic somewhere around here as well, as revealed in, uh, as discussed in Kamlish's most recent paper and some of the other papers listed here. So the non-thermal phenomena, the radio sources that we see in clusters of galaxies, the diffuse radio sources we see in clusters of galaxies. We have, broadly speaking, three distinct classes, um, which you know date back nearly two decades now to, uh, for example, uh, Kempner et al. 2004. Broadly speaking, our taxonomy breaks down into radio relics. And here is an example that is sometimes known as the toothbrush relic because it looks a bit like a toothbrush. Um, we have radio halos, such as this diffuse uh, radio halo here in a paper from Amanda Wilbur and collaborators a few years ago. And finally, we have uh, on smaller scales, we have these things called mini halos. And I'm going to break these down a little bit further in the next few slides as well. But then just a point to note, we also have these kind of transitional cases that show that, you know, maybe our taxonomy is not quite as, uh, co as comprehensive as we thought. And, you know, we need to go a bit deeper. So radio relics, uh, here is a full scale image of, the, of this cluster, 1RXSJ0603, which I may well refer to as the toothbrush relic because it hosts the, the, this toothbrush relic. Um, but I wanted to show you a bit, of a, a bit of a rogues gallery. I'm gonna show you lots of pretty pictures here. So there's all kinds of radio relics in the literature like this one from a recent paper by Kenda Knowles from the Meerkat Galaxy Cluster Legacy Survey. Uh, Abel 3667, one of the canonical double relic systems in the southern sky. You've got this gorgeous northwest relic and the southeast relic. Um, my first first author paper was on this cluster, but gosh, I wish I'd had this, these data back in those days because these data are just fantastic. Again, this is Meerkat showing you just how fantastic Meerkat is. Um, Max J0717 hosts a complex uh, radio relic that is broken down into these four components sometimes referred to as a chair-shaped relic, but um, that's, I'm not the biggest fan of that name. Um, Abel 2256 hosts a gorgeous, huge filamentary relic that is looks very different to a lot of the other ones that we see, but uh, I will break down the physics of that a bit later. Um, and this particular South Pole Telescope cluster hosts a pair of radio relics that you're seeing here in red. So, you know, we have this huge diversity of um, radio relics in terms of angular angular size, radio power, morphology. Um, there's all kinds of relics out there. But what characteristics do they have in common? Well, radio relics typically are you know, about a megaparsec in size. They sit towards the cluster outskirts, although projection is very important. Um, projection plays a role here. Uh, when you image them at high sensitivity and high resolution, you can see that they frequently decompose into these roughly filamentary arc-like substructures. Uh, they are typically steep spectrum with a spectral index of minus 1.1 or thereabouts, where I, I adopt that particular spectral index convention. And they are, broadly speaking, characterized by a single power law in terms of their spectral energy distribution, so how their brightness varies as a function of frequency. Uh, relics are, typically have a very high uh, fractional polarization, you know, at least of the order of 30% or so, but this is highly frequency dependent. And really what this implies is that they have a highly ordered magnetic field. Um, relics, as with many uh, cluster science objects, uh, have these strong multi-messenger synergies. We like to hammer on the multi-messenger nature of our science, but certainly with clusters, this is very, very true. Um, X-ray data are very complementary when studying clusters because uh, radio relics are frequently found to be coincident with these kind of discontinuities seen in the X-ray uh, images of clusters. Um, so 
typically we see these as X-ray shocks. So really what we're tracing here are uh, the sites where electrons are being reaccelerated by shocks. Um, you know, circa a year or two ago, there were, were around 60 or so known radio relics, but with recent surveys like the Meerkat GCLS, the Galaxy Cluster Legacy Survey, and the Low Far Two Meter Sky Survey, you know, these recent, uh, these very recent cutting edge surveys are identifying, you know, several to many tens of new relics and new relic candidates. So we're able to get a lot deeper with our cutting edge science. Okay, radio halos. Again, I'm going to show you some pretty plots. Uh, here's a couple of slightly unusual looking radio halos um, found and discussed by Stefan Duchesne and collaborators earlier this year. Both these clusters are studied in the same paper, ABA 141 and 3404. Um, Andrea Bottion, a couple of years ago, found a double component, a double radio halo in this double cluster. So this is quite unusual and quite interesting because you have two clusters that are um, thought to be not necessarily actively merging, but either on approach or after a merger event, I forget which off the top of my head, but we see a double radio halo, which is extremely unusual in the realm of cluster physics. So it's a really cool paper, so I suggest you check it out. And finally, the radio halo in the Coma cluster. Um, Coma is one of the you know, nearest and most famous clusters. So it has this fantastic giant radio halo that we can study in lots of detail. Uh, it also has this really nice radio relic and plenty of bent tail radio galaxies all over the place and a radio bridge here. But Coma is really one of the prototypical examples of the radio halo. So again, I will show you the full field Coma image and discuss some of the radio halo properties. Um, radio halos are, again, they're highly extended. They're typically around a megaparsec in size. Uh, radio halos tend to be centrally located and follow the thermal distribution of the ICM. If you remember back to the image of Abel 2744 I showed you earlier, the radio halo and the uh, intracluster medium as traced by the X-rays uh, followed very much the same kind of shape and uh, angular extent. Halos tend to be kind of amorphous, although they sometimes exhibit filamentary substructure like you're seeing here in Coma. There's sort of some various hooks um, and you know, edges and structures that trace complex subgrid physics um, that we are, you know, on the cusp of studying and understanding. Uh, halos are also typically quite steep spectral index. Again, they typically have a spectral index for around minus 1.1 and generally follow quite a single power law emission. However, unlike relics, um, halos typically exhibit very, very low fractional polarization, uh, less than a few percent which really implies that the magnetic field is tangled on scales that are smaller than we can resolve with our radio telescopes, um, which follows naturally from what we believe to be the underlying particle acceleration mechanism, which I will come on to shortly. Um, but again, um, radio halos are also um, extremely good examples of where we can use our multi-messenger data to exploit really good synergies and really untangle the complex physics at play. Because of this similar extent and morphology we see in the radio and the X-ray, this implies quite a strong connection between the thermal and the non-thermal components. And understanding the coupling of those thermal and non-thermal components is the, the mainstay of my research. Again, uh, we knew of about 85 clusters hosting radio halos as of 2019 or 2020. But again, with the low far two meter sky survey and the Meerkat Galaxy Cluster Legacy Survey, for example, these are these revolutionary surveys and data sets are allowing us to discover several tens of new halos, as well as finding out new details on existing ones. So we're really undergoing a fantastic um, transitionary period where we're finally getting the kind of sample sizes and data quality that are allowing us to understand the physics and get down to the nitty gritty details of what's going on. Finally, mini halos. Um, mini halos are quite pretty. They are smaller. Um, and here's a couple of examples. Here's a handful of examples from the literature um, from RxJ 1720.1, the famous Perseus cluster. And here is one in a cluster that I am working on myself. Um, this is from some Meerkat data. This is low far, low band antenna, down very low at uh, uh, to several tens of megahertz frequencies, for example. Mini halos, as you might infer from the name, they are typically a lot smaller. They're only sort of on the hundreds of kiloparsec scale, typically one to 300 kiloparsecs or so. 
They are again um, generally quite central and they follow the thermal intracluster medium and they are broadly speaking quite amorphous, although if you look at these examples here, you can see evidence of substructure and edges and discontinuities and those kind of things. Mini halos also typically have quite a steep spectral index. They're a little bit steeper in general um, than your classical relics and halos. And again, they, sing, they follow a single power law. Um, in terms of mini halo polarization properties, well, we don't expect um, we don't expect any significant polarized emission from mini halos, and we haven't found any to date. But no one's really taken a look at uh, statistical samples of mini halos with high quality polarization ready data yet. So this is still an open question. But again, it kind of implies that we have a highly tangled magnetic field. Again, uh, multi-messenger synergy is key, and this is a note that you will notice I'm hammering on, but it's a key component of our studies. Um, the radio emission that we see generally follows the central regions of the X-ray plasma. So again, we have this strong connection between the thermal and non-thermal components of the intracluster medium. And mini halos are found in relaxed clusters that have um, you know, radio loud, radio powerful, brightest cluster galaxies that we see here in the center of MS-55 here in RxJ1720 and uh, here in Perseus. So really you can see that the, this diffuse radio emission surrounds these powerful radio galaxies. So this also gives us a clear sign that mini halos may very well be connected to radio galaxies. Um, mini halos are you know, a little bit of a trickier case because they're relatively small um, and faint steep spectrum objects. And the fact that they're co-located with these bright radio galaxies means that we found fewer of them. So as of last year, there were only around 30 known mini halos compared to, you know, 100 uh, halos and 100 other relics. But the Meerkat Galaxy Cluster Legacy Survey has allowed us to find several new mini halos. So the numbers are creeping up. Um, and it's really, again, this next generation data that is allowing us to start to detect these kind of objects and, and figure out the underlying physics in more detail. Okay. Um, a little bit of a little bit more physics, a little bit more detailed physics, looking at particle acceleration mechanisms. Here you're going to be seeing a video um, put together for me a few years ago by Dennis Whittor uh, of a merger event between clusters um, that shows the structures we would expect to see in the density, the temperature, and the X-ray surface brightness emission. So many of the sources I have described are, in fact, linked with cluster mergers. Relics and halos in particular are linked with cluster mergers. These are dramatic events. These are some of the most energetic events since the Big Bang, uh, and they dump huge quantities of energy into the intercluster medium uh, in, the, in the form of shocks and turbulence and give rise to these diffuse radio sources that we can see. Every now and then in the, in the temperature uh, map, you'll be able to see um, be able to see a shock uh, occur and propagate outwards and I will attempt to trace it with my mouse when it appears it appears around here there we go we get a radio relic traveling uh, well we get we get a shock traveling outwards and downwards so for radio relics we think that the physical mechanism is diffusive shock acceleration or DSA which essentially if you'll allow me to uh, be a bit cartoony you have your cosmic ray electron and it encounters a shock wave propagating outwards uh, following a cluster merger event. Um, and what happens is your electron kind of bounces back and forth across the shock front, gaining energy each time. Uh, eventually, it will escape downstream and uh, losses, energy loss mechanisms will take over and they, as, the, as the particle ages. But until that happens, the electron gains energy every time it crosses the shock front. And as such, even relatively low energy electrons from the intercluster medium can get accelerated up to the relativistic regime. Um, for the turbulent reacceleration scenario, this is kind of really what you're seeing in the temperature and X-ray surface brightness structures. Um, sorry, I should have done this. Uh, for halos and mini halos, we believe that, uh, that there are two particle acceleration mechanisms in play. There are two leading models. You've got your turbulent reacceleration, your primary models, which you, know, you can see the turbulence following the cluster merger in the uh, X-ray surface brightness and temperature maps, all these complex structures, this is your turbulence. Um, alternatively, we have this, the secondary models or secondary or hadronic models. Uh, and if you'll allow me another cartoon, what happens in the hadronic model is you get um, your highly energetic cosmic ray protons fired out by your cluster member radio galaxies. And these interact with your thermal protons of the intracluster medium, <clears throat> excuse me, 
uh, cause a bit of a particle cascade uh, that eventually, you know, they, they decay into some pions, which eventually decay into your cosmic ray electrons. So that is how you generate large scale synchrotron sources under the hadronic model. Um, alternatively, uh, I mentioned that uh, mini halos only occur in relaxed clusters, but no, I'm showing you simulations of a cluster merger. So how does the turbulent scenario work in mini halos? Here is a simulation on, which you're seeing on the right. Um, you're seeing the ICM temperature in this color map. And I apologize that it's not a video. I would love to have had a video of this, but I was not able to get my hands on one in time. Um, and synthetic radio emission. And uh, essentially for mini halos in the turbulent scenario, you get minor mergers or close interactions between clusters that don't quite collide, but pass close enough uh, to each other that uh, the clusters get disturbed. And that sets off what we refer to as core sloshing. Um, and that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing this large scale sloshing spiral uh, around the cool core of this cluster, giving rise to this uh, diffuse radio emission. So essentially that is how the turbulent reacceleration scenario works for uh, mini halos and relaxed clusters. You know, any good model makes some predictions uh, and we can test these. So in terms of diffusive shock acceleration, we expect that relics correlate with recent or ongoing mergers. The model quite naturally predicts a power law spectrum and a spectral index gradient as you go away from the leading edge of relics um, as your electrons age. And you see an ordered magnetic field, which is typically aligned with the shock front, which gives rise to this significant polarized emission. For the turbulent reacceleration scenario in halos and mini halos, uh, we would expect that these, these models predict that uh, halos and mini halos would be found in uh, you know, disturbed clusters. So in the case of your giant halos, this is your merging clusters. And in the case of mini halos, this is your moderately disturbed sloshing clusters. Uh, it also predicts quite a steep spectrum and it predicts that some halos should be should have ultra steep spectra. Uh, we should see fluctuations in the spectral index. Uh, we should see all kinds of things like high frequency spectral breaks and radial steepening. Conversely, the hadronic model broadly predicts that all clusters should host halos because all clusters have radio galaxies, all clusters have thermal protons. Um, and the lifetime of your cosmic ray protons is a lot longer. So cosmic ray protons can get really far out and collide with the hot protons of the intracluster medium uh, and generate these generate hadronic halos. Um, and we predict the hadronic models predict that the spectral index again should be quite steep, but largely uniform. Um, but a key component is gamma ray emission. Um, and both, um, both the hadronic and turbulent models do predict a strong correlation between radio surface brightness and X-ray surface brightness, although the nature of this correlation is different. Now then, the hadronic model simply does not work for giant radio halos. A purely hadronic model does not work for giant radio halos, simply because um, Fermi has been in space long enough staring at uh, the coma cluster, which hosts a known radio halo for long enough that, the, that if, uh, if the coma halo was purely hadronic, we would detect gamma ray emission uh, from the halo. And the upper limits from Fermi are just simply too constraining. But uh, mini halos, because they're a smaller scale, you have a smaller integrated volume of potentially gamma ray emitting hadronic halo. Uh, the upper limits from Fermi are compatible. So we can't rule out hadronic models for mini halos just yet. And there are many, many open questions that we see in, in these fields. Uh, the nitty gritty details of diffusive shock acceleration. Uh, ex exactly how uh, the weak shocks that we see in cluster mergers can accelerate uh, protons all the way from the thermal pool of the intracluster medium up to the relativistic regime. Or whether a pre-existing, pre-energized, uh, mildly relativistic population is required such as might be injected by cluster member radio galaxies, for example. Um, the nature of the radio X-ray correlation in halos and mini halos, for example, that's one of the open questions. Exactly what is the uh, microclimate physics that is going on in there? Um, and in mini halos, are mini halos generated by turbulence or are they hadronic or are they some combination of the two? And there are many other open questions, but these kind of questions are what drive my research.
now that I've told you, hopefully, all the uh, uh, all the physics that you need to know and um, to understand the rest of my talk, uh, apologies for the kind of whistle stop nature of the of the tour. Um, but hopefully, there is enough uh, information there for you to follow what's going to be going on in the rest of the talk. So it's time to discuss the state of the field. Um, what do we know about radio relics? Let's start with radio relics. Um, and I should apologize in advance, I'm not going to be covering uh, radio halos in any detail because I don't have the time, but I will be covering mini halos in detail as well because mini halos are something that I'm working on right now. Um, we have three fantastic recent examples in the literature, which you've all seen before earlier in my slides. You've got the toothbrush, you've got the relic in Max J0717, and you've got this fantastic filamentary radio relic in Abel 2256. Um, Abel 2256 and Max J0717 have been typically in the past considered somewhat unusual based on the kind of very different morphology um, of the radio relics that we see. However, when we look at the extremely broad band spectral energy distribution, the spectrum for each of these radio relics, which is seen below from papers by Kamlesh Raj Parohit, she's been extremely productive um, and does some fantastic, amazingly detailed and thorough work. So thank you Kamlesh for all of your hard work. Um, using these ultra broadband SEDs that go from low far frequencies, you know, hundreds of megahertz up to the UGMRT at, uh, you know, again, hundreds of megahertz up to high frequency data from the VLA up to nearly 10 gigahertz. We see that in each case, all of these relics follow a single power law behavior. And if you plot the uh, integrated spectral index of each of these relics, um, we see that in fact, despite this, despite the very different, very strikingly different morphologies, we see consistent uh, and very similar spectral index behavior not just for the entire relic, but for also the different components. They all follow very similar power law behavior with no sign of any spectral break. So really the, what this suggests is that the same mechanism is powering all three of these relics despite the strikingly different morphology, which is really great for our understanding and for our theoreticians. The picture gets a little bit more complicated when you move into the resolved spectral properties. So I'm gonna show you some resolved spectral index maps and some color color plots, and I'm gonna break them down for you. So here's the spectral index map of the toothbrush relic and the color color plot. Now, a color color plot is a very, very useful tool um, and it might look slightly complicated. And I've deliberately left off the axis labels, but essentially you need data at at least three different frequencies, four or more is better, but at least three. And what we're looking at here is um, the low frequency versus high frequency spectral index. Um, anywhere you see a dashed line, that is the unity line. So anything close to the line is uh, a region of a radio relic where we have uh, recent or ongoing uh, particle acceleration because the spectral index at low frequencies and high frequencies is essentially the same. Anything that sits above the line um, is more complex because we have a... Uh, flatter spectrum at high frequencies than low frequencies, which might well tell us that um, either we have some self-absorption at low frequencies or that we are in fact seeing overlapping features that overlap, features that overlap along the line of sight. And then any regions that are below this line, um, these are sources, these are regions that have undergone energy loss. So particle acceleration has stopped and or is subdominant to aging losses. And aging losses are the dominant thing that's going on in the spectrum. So what we see in the toothbrush, um, we see a clear flat spectral index, quite flat towards the leading edge. And then the, it gets steeper uh, as you go downstream. And overall, the majority of the radio relic, the radio relic itself sits below the line. The chair relic in MACJ0717 is a little more complicated. We see fluctuations in the spectral index. Um, we see some hints of a gradient, but it's not clear cut and we see fluctuations. And the relic itself exhibits some pretty complex behavior in the color color plane. And in ABEL2256, it's again, a little bit different. We see fluctuations and we see no clear signs of any gradient in this radio relic, which is intriguing. It means it's a little bit unusual but I will come on to the interpretation in a second. Uh, because when you look at the color color plot for Abel 2256, 
Um, the northern part, which is roughly this component up here, um, sits pretty much on or below the line, whereas the southern part of the radio relic sits mostly, which, which is this part, sits mostly above this unity line. So we see this mixed behavior. And essentially what this tells us is that in the toothbrush relic in R one RxSJ0603, we have a relatively simple case of a radio relic that is viewed mostly edge on, um, might be slightly inclined to the line of sight, but we're essentially seeing a simple, the simplest case of an edge on radio relic. Whereas in MaxJ0717 and ABEL 2256, the situation is much more complex and we see evidence of overlapping substructures, which is really cool. These radio wavelength observations are allowing us to uh, learn things about the 3D structure of the microphysics that's going on in particle acceleration on megaparsec scales and galaxy clusters, which is just fantastic. Um, however, things are always complex. And here is a gorgeous image of, uh, of Abel 3266, which is a fantastic, uh, highly complex merging subcluster in the southern sky. Um, this is an image from a paper that I am working on. There are many radio galaxies in this cluster that are very cool. We see this source D2, which is a fossil, uh, it's a fossil source. You know, we're doing cluster archaeology with our radio data. Um, essentially, what this is, is it's an old radio galaxy that has switched off and is just now aging and aging away. And then we see this, uh, what we call a wrong way relic. And if I zoom in a little bit, uh, a little bit further, you see this uh, curved shape. This is two gigahertz data from the Com Australia Telescope Compact Array and 900 megahertz data from ASCAP. Um, we're seeing this relic uh, traveling from the north to the south. We see this clear spectral index gradient, but we see this concave curvature, which is a smoking gun signature of a complex cluster merger event, like we have in ABEL 3266. But you remember how I told you previously that, you know, some really nicely well-studied relics in with ultra broadband data have clearly single power law spectral index uh, behavior? Well, the wrong way relic in ABEL 3266 is an exception to this. We have a clear broken power law spectrum. Um, and this isn't the only example. There are at least there is at least one other example there in the literature in a recent paper by Viral Parekh and collaborators on the uh, Saraswati supercluster. So some relics do have spectral breaks, it would appear, which is very interesting because the presence of a spectral break implies that we have an aged particle population that is undergoing uh, acceleration, or in other words, we have reacceleration. This spectral break is an absolute smoking gun evidence that we do not have diffusive shock acceleration just from the thermal pool, but in fact, we have re-acceleration going on. So this is really where the state of the field is at in terms of radio relics. Moving on to mini halos. Um, this is a mini halo that I've shown you before in RxJ 1720 from a paper by Nadia Biava and collaborators. This is LOFAR LBA data at 54 megahertz. We've got multiple components here that you can see. There's this central mini halo, which is quite steep spectrum, but it's perhaps a bit flatter than we might expect for a mini halo, bearing in mind what I told you earlier in the talk. There is this eastern extension that has a marginally steeper spectrum. Um, you can kind of see it enhanced in the surface brightness here. Um, and then we have this southwest extension that has an extremely steep spectral index of minus three. So clearly we have multiple components um, in this mini halo, which is unusual for a relaxed cluster, uh, but it's extremely interesting. And when studying the point-to-point -point correlations, so here for halos, we like to use the point-to-point -point correlation between radio surface brightness and X-ray surface brightness to understand the connection between the thermal and non-thermal components in the intracluster medium. Um, and it's, more details than I have time to go into, but essentially the slope of this correlation can tell us exactly how strong the connection is between your magnetic fields and your thermal components. Um, and it can also tell you about the underlying physics of the particle acceleration mechanism. So these three different components, the central mini halo, that eastern extension, and then the southwest uh, diffuse emission, actually you can see that they exhibit strikingly different behavior in, in the slope. The mini halo is very well described by quite a, a steep superlinear relation. 
Uh, this eastern extension breaks from that very clearly. It is very, very different. And then this southwest diffuse emission um, is, again, different. And the fact that these slopes are so different uh, is quite telling. Um, these different components show these different correlations, which, if you work through the physics, um, suggests that perhaps these different components are, in fact, generated by different underlying physical mechanisms. Uh, the central mini halo could theoretically be hadronic in nature, whereas the southwest extension may perhaps be um, generated by turbulence. Um, or perhaps it tells us that actually we have the same mechanism in all the components, but we have a different uh, microclimate. The environmental conditions are different. Perhaps that's the density of the magnetic fields or the strength of magnetic fields or the uh, density of the intercluster medium. There's so much to unpack here, um, and it's unfortunately more, way more than I have time to go into in this talk, but there's rich physics that we're untangling with these new highly sensitive data. Similarly, um, I, I couldn't give a talk without giving a little bit of a uh, teaser of a paper I've got that's in preparation and will hopefully be submitted soon. This is a mini halo in MS1455. Uh, this is meerkat data. And what you're seeing here are the, in yellow, you're seeing uh, coal fronts, which broadly speaking in, in the past has been uh, believed to kind of mark the boundaries of where the acceleration is going on. However, as you can see from this, the, the, the cyan haze here, uh, as you can see, the radio emission extends far, far beyond the coal fronts. This mini halo is highly extended. It's nearly 600 kiloparsecs in size. Uh, there's a lot more diffuse emission than you're just seeing here. I am saving the, the best plots of the paper, but the, there's a lot more diffuse emission than you can just see here. And it has a relatively steep spectral index, but again, flatter than you might expect for a mini halo. And if we look at the point-to-point -point correlations at uh, 1.4 gigahertz and 145 megahertz, so from Meerkat data and LOFAR data, um, we see, again, we see a superlinear slope similar to the mini halo that Nadia, found, that Nadia has studied in ArcsJ1720, but um, we, broadly speaking, see a single component uh, in the in, in the point-to-point -point correlation. The entire mini halo, broadly speaking, follows the same behavior, which is not what we saw in RxJ1720. However, when you look at plotting the radial profiles, which again, we can use to study that connection between um, thermal and non-thermal. So you're seeing diffuse radio emission contours overlaid on the uh, X-ray surface brightness. So your, your thermal and non-thermal. We extracted the profiles along these two different wedges. And what those profiles show us is a bit like this. Um, and these are slightly complicated plots, um, but essentially what we see is that the radio emission to the, in this northern wedge falls off quite sharply with radius. Um, whereas to the south in this cyan wedge, it falls off quite sharply and then there's a bump and it continues. Uh, and you can see this at both 145 megahertz and 1.5 three gigahertz. So really, for neither, neither of these arcs uh, do we find a single exponential um, profile gives us a good fit. Whereas um, a single beta model, which is kind of the x-ray equivalent, um, without going into too much detail, um, a single component does provide a fairly good fit to the x-ray data. So that's quite interesting as well. So really, we see a single cor you know, unlike um, RxJ1720, we see a nice single correlation in the radio and X-ray point-to-point -point correlations, but we see multiple components in the spatially resolved um, surface brightness profiles. So this has interesting implications that we're still unpacking for the connection between those thermal and non thermal components. And, you know, as if things are not confused enough, the plot gets even thicker and has become even thicker over the last few years. So in a couple of clusters, the Abel 399401 system and the uh, Abel 1758 system, we started to see these ultra large scale radio bridges connecting these uh, pre-merging clusters. So these papers by Gavoni et al and Botion et al. So yeah, we're seeing these you know, ultra low surface brightness gigantic radio bridges. Um, in other clusters, this is uh, an image of the cluster Abel 2877 from a paper by Torrance Hodgson from earlier this year. 
we see this ultra steep spectrum jellyfish, which is uh, believed to be a very short lived, very late evolutionary phase of a radio galaxy. So not necessarily, um, not strictly speaking, ICM related, but it's, you know, fossil plasma from various different cluster galaxies that has been gently re-accelerated by processes in the cluster and has a, a mind-blowingly steep spectral index of almost minus six, which is, I think, the, as far as I'm aware, the steepest spectral index that has ever been measured. It's only with the fantastic broad bandwidth of the Murchison Wide Field Array Telescope located in Western Australia that uh, we have been able, that Torrance was, Torrance was able to um, map the spectral index of this source and learn something about physics. And finally, as if these aren't cool enough, um, this is a recent paper from Andrea Botion um, looking at the cluster Abel 2255. There's all kinds of dynamic and cool radio galaxies and you know, these things that are referred to as commas and the you know, T-bone and the ghost and all of these kinds of things. And you can see some diffuse radio emissions sticking out um, to the northeast and there's this sort of radio relic. Uh, there's this kind of diffuse haze of a radio halo. This cluster is, you know, full of uh, diffuse, a very faint diffuse radio emission. And I don't have an image of it, but um, Andrea is working on some much, much deeper uh, LOFAR data on this cluster. And really just the entire cluster volume is full of ultra large scale, highly diffuse, very faint um, radio emission that can only be seen by telescopes like the Low Frequency Array. So stay tuned for some really cool papers by Andrea Botion uh, unpacking this letter in, uh, well, probably in 2022 by this rate, but there's just so much to unpack here. The plot is very thick. Um, okay, finally, uh, because I've probably talked for long enough, where are we going with this? Um, where are we going? Well, Right now, we're in a period of an all-sky renaissance that is going to be uh, unfolding over the next few years. We've got surveys with the Low Frequency Array, LOFAR, the Murchison Wide Field Array, and ASCAP, the Australian SKO Pathfinder. Um, all of these all-sky surveys, like LOPS and LOLs, the Low Frequency the LBA counterpart, the GLENAX survey, and EMU, studying the sky, at both the, the northern sky and the southern sky, in unprecedented detail at low frequencies. Um, it's just going to be fantastic for cluster science. We're going to be able to finally do highly statistically significant studies of non-thermal phenomena in clusters. Targeted follow-up with instruments like the UGMRT, which you see here in the top right, which gives fantastic sensitivity, um, particularly in the 300 to 950 megahertz frequency ranges where the GMRT really specializes, in my experience, across a, a phenomenal 90% of the sky. So whether your target is in the northern sky or the southern sky, chances are you're going to be able to get GMRT data on it, which was just fantastic for unpacking the underlying physics. Um, Meerkat, I mean, Meerkat is fantastic. If you've seen any of the papers from the Galaxy Cluster Legacy Survey or any talks from Meerkat over uh, recent years, but particularly recent months, Meerkat has just unparalleled sensitivity at L-band. We're doing such cool science with it. Um, and the UHF band, and actually pretty soon Meerkat will have S band as well, which is just going to be amazing for studying um, clusters in the southern sky in particular, uh, in unparalleled detail and sensitivity. And one of my uh, one of my favorite telescopes, the Australia Telescope Compact Array, which only has six dishes, but if you're patient, we have the tools to do fantastically high dynamic range science with the Compact Array. Um, very soon, there's going to be the big cat correlator upgrade, which will double the already impressive bandwidth. So uh, it's just going to be, again, fantastic for following up clusters. And before too long, we're going to be in the era of the square kilometer array, which is just going to give us a deluge of data in unparalleled, again, sensitivity uh, and almost unparalleled resolution across the southern sky. So really, now is the time to get involved in cluster science because the SKA era is going to be amazing. It's going to be once again transformational um, and we'll hopefully be able to answer all of those open questions that I posed earlier. But finally to um, hammer, alone, hammer home one of the messages, it's dangerous to go alone. You know, we, we need this multi-wavelength synergy uh, with telescopes like Erosita and like XMM and optical data with things like the Dark Energy Survey 
to unpack the physics of what's going on. So that's where we're going. And finally, just to wrap up, I want to show you these three pretty pictures again because they're fantastic. I love them. Um, clusters are highly enigmatic objects. They're extremely dynamic environments. Even those that appear relaxed, there's always some kind of dynamic activity going on pretty much. The deeper we go, the more I find that there's no such thing as a relaxed cluster. We can use clusters to study a wide range of physical processes in all kinds of rich physics. Um, Multi-messenger astronomy is absolutely essential. You know, we need these X-ray and optical data to really unpack the physics of what's going on. We've learned a lot. We've learned a lot about particle acceleration mechanisms, the connection between thermal and non-thermal, your hot plasma and magnetic fields. And we've learned a lot about galaxy evolution and dynamic environments. But every study we do, every new insight we gain also brings new questions and challenges. So really, if, you've, if you take one thing from this talk, it's that it's time to rewrite our taxonomy based on physics. And with these next generation data sets, these next generation multi-wavelength data sets, we're gonna be able to do this. And so uh, thank you for listening. I will take questions. That's fantastic. Many thanks, Chris, for this lovely talk, this uh, amazing you know, uh, overview for clusters, for magnetic fields, for everything. Thank you so much. And people are already you know, very excited with this because we already have a few uh, questions from the chat already. So let me start with this. So from uh, uh, Benjamin Hugo. So uh, Chris, uh, has uh, anyone attempted polarimetric studies with VLBI on known halos and mini halos? I think even Meerkat does not have the required resolution needed to avoid beam depolarization on the scales involved. Typically, these extended patches are only a few beams across to start with. So that's the question from Benjamin Hugo. Thanks, Ben. Yes, a, exactly. That's 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 a great question. Um, that's one of the things that I want to do with MS1455 and some of the other mini halos that I'm looking at uh, with, with Meerkat and other telescopes. But exa you're exactly right. Um, one of we we're into the regime where we have two competing effects. These sources are extremely diffuse. So you need, uh, you, know, you need a larger beam to be able to pick up enough signal to noise to detect the source. But if your beam is too large, you're averaging over you know, mag tangled magnetic field structures. So you end up with depolarization. So um, essentially, yeah, we're in the regime of two competing effects that act in opposite directions. Uh, if we boost our sensitivity to radio continuum emission, then we too much, then we downweight our, we, you know, we lose our sensitivity to polarized emission. Um, and I'm not sure whether uh, we'll be able to um, hit that sweet spot with telescopes like Meerkat or like the JVLA. Um, when it comes to VLBI, actually getting back to the crux of your question, VLBI, um, to the best of my knowledge, no one's really attempted it, but I don't think that VLBI um, observations would have enough surface brightness sensitivity to actually pick up the diffuse radio emission from the mini halos. Because even with some of these, even with some of the central radio galaxies, we see that we lose some of the um, we lose some of the diffuse emission from cluster member radio galaxies when we go to VLBI, uh, you know, VLBI precision. So if we're losing uh, radio emission from sources that are, you know, one, two, ten Melojanskis, then when we're looking at sources that are kind of microjansky um, surface brightness, then I just don't think it's really going to be a realistic prospect. But we'll see what happens in the SKA era. I mean, SKA VLBI might have the might have the sensitivity to do it. I'm not really a VLBI expert, so uh, if you're watching this and you disagree with me on that, then sorry. <laughs> Okay. Um, cool. Okay, Ben, I've seen your response to that. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Yes, it, maybe ex, the extended Meerkat SKA mid one. Yes. Um, I think that would be, that's going to be a really natural uh, stepping stone test point for, for this kind of study. Yep. Yep. Many thanks. 
Uh, so if anyone, uh, of course, has a, a, any questions, please write them. I can uh, just uh, say them to Chris, or if you just want to do them on your own, please let me know. Uh, another question from uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah White. Sorry, one second. Uh, awesome, Chris. Uh, are the mini halos, how big are the errors on the spectral indices? Ooh, um, that's, the, that's, that's a great question. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, errors on the spectral indices are quite low, actually. They're typically, well, off the top of my head, I can't really, I can't give you a precise value, but uh, the certainly for MS1455, the typical error on the spectral index is less than 0.1, more like 0.05. So it's definitely quite a steep spectral index around generally consistent with minus one, minus 1.1. 1 .1. Okay, many thanks. Any other questions? Uh, well, I can't help but asking as well because I was amazed by the, uh, okay, Sarah says that's cool. Thank you very much, great talk. Uh, I, of course, I wanted to ask about the mini halo with the multiple components. I mean, I, I don't have it uh, exactly the details at the top of my head, but let's say if I would, uh, if I could just ask a, a, a time scale or somehow a, a sequence of events. So how would you describe how we got there? Yes, multiple structures, uh, different probably parameters, but if you can just at least again, yeah, because this is, I don't know, to me, this, this is fascinating, this, these results are. Oh, yes, thank you. This is and um, this is a great. That's a great question, and this is a an interesting challenge for us observers to team up with the theorists and particularly folks who do numerical simulations of cluster interactions. Um, but off the top of my head, if you, I could think that perhaps you might generate multiple multi-component mini halos um, if you have different. This, I'm going to use some very hand wavy terms here. Uh, if you have some different clumps of fossil plasma that um, get gently reaccelerated by you know these gentle uh, interactions, these off-axis mergers, these sloshing events, um, we generate those sloshing spirals. And if a sloshing spiral perhaps encounters uh, a clump of fossil plasma sitting out there in the intercluster medium, gently reaccelerates it. Um, then we might end up with the kind of very steep spectrum uh, emission like we see, like Nadia sees in RxJ1720, for example. Um, for MS1455 plus 22, again, that's a really good, that's, that, that's a difficult one to explain. Um, but again, I would probably, I would largely put it down to um, more large scale, um, large scale gentle sloshing. You could kind of, this is an analogy I like to use uh, in terms of uh, core sloshing. You could kind of think about it, if you take a bowl of jello and like give it a gentle tap on the side and it sets off that wobbling motion, that's kind of how I, that's how I picture, uh, you know, core sloshing in my head. Um, it's a fun, it's a fun picture. But yeah, we're still unpacking what's going on in MS1455. So um, you'll have to stay tuned for the paper. Yep, that's great. Many thanks, many thanks. Are there any... Other questions or anything that anyone want to say? If not, then uh, we should, okay. Yeah, Paul Fallon, thanks, fascinating presentation. So yes, if uh, that's it, then we would like to thank once again our speaker, Chris. Many thanks for this uh, fantastic overview and trip uh, among galaxies and clusters and magnetic fields and all these amazing hot topics. and. Uh, we wish all the best. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks for listening to me ramble for the past hour or so. And uh, you know, my my email inbox and my my Twitter inbox are always open. So feel free to uh, drop me an email, slide into my DMs. You know, um, feel free to just get in touch. Thanks very much. Great.